Hello and welcome back to a new Rage Gaming video, my name is Hollow and today we're taking a look at Elder Scrolls Online, the Bethesda MMORPG based on the Elder Scrolls universe. This bad boy released over six years ago now, at the very start of 2014, and it released to rather mixed reception. At the time, I had played during the beta and a little bit after the launch, but didn't even last more than a few weeks playing it. I just couldn't appreciate the style of game because of how different it was to every other main MMO I played before. Today, however, However, after many expansions, regular updates, continued support of this now massive game, I've heard continued praise on praise for how far this game has come since launch and how worth trying it is today. So as someone who played the game briefly at its rather awkward start, I decided to go back and figure out, is ESO worth playing in 2020? Since this comes from the perspective of a new player, I'm obviously focusing on that new player experience and what that had to offer me in my first week of playing, but I have researched Endgame too, so we have some of that to talk about. Let's start with perhaps the biggest draw to an Elder Scrolls fan, the setting and the story. Elder Scrolls Online doesn't take place in one region like your regular Scrolls game, like Skyrim taking place in Skyrim, but involves the whole world. When we zoom out on the map, we see that familiar layout with the different regions, laid as much as they actually are in the lore. But but each region here is one massive zone that revolves around a main story to experience and is absolutely crammed with events, side stories, many secrets wrapped up in that exact vibe of any Scrolls game. The classic humour, the dark stories, gods and Daedric princes, monsters, plots. Whether you're dealing with a battle with the Daedra trying to meld planes of existence, fighting for the Imperial throne or just helping an alchemist fuck with a business rival. What's going on out here? I, I have half a mind to... Cats? No! Ah! I'm It's all in a universe that is well established and has a lot of history. So, if you're an old fan, it's really cool to step into this world and instantly recognize the different regions. And I obviously immediately look for Cyrodiil and the Imperial City, since my favorite game of the series has always been Oblivion. Or if you're a totally new player, you just know that there's a lot to learn about and see as you wander through this sort of amusement park of lore and the world itself. As far as I see it, ESO is a celebration of the Scrolls lore, and that's brilliant. Now, obviously the game from the start was in a prime position with its world and its story, but what about the combat? I think it has a lot going for it with this weird mix between tab targeting and aiming. You make use of basic attacks, heavy attacks, blocking, interrupting, dodge rolling, class abilities, weapon abilities, the magic and stamina bars, racial abilities, potions and buffs or debuffs. Like I said, there's a lot going on here mechanically, but it was introduced to me step by step in a pretty chill way. Whenever I leveled up, I will get a new attribute point and a skill point, and it would suggest what I should go for next out of three good options. The mechanics of fighting were shown throughout the tutorial and in the following hours of play, so I had no issue with picking this stuff up. I began playing ESO with the Nightblade class, a magical rogue. Currently, I'll head into combat from stealth and stun the enemy by hitting them on the flanks. I'll exploit that stun with a heavy attack and follow that with my ambush to do more damage for 10 seconds. Combine that with my ultimate that further weakens them and bursts them, which puts them low enough for me to execute them with my ranged finisher, which instantly kills targets under 25%. Mid-combat, I'm able to reposition well around my targets with stealth. I'm able to sap and steal health with vampiric attacks. I can stun and exploit from the flanks, and I can even teleport to targets from long range. This is a lot, right? And at this point, I was only level 11, and I've got so much more to unlock or morph. To say the least, it feels very unique and mechanically really fun. But visually, on the other hand, it's so lackluster. The animations and the hit weight just feels totally off. Things are clunky and even floaty in almost every fight, and that's probably probably the weakest aspect of the game, this weird lacking visuals for the combat. Though the mechanics of the fighting are great and interesting, it falls totally flat when you look at the animations and well, how weird this looks. Let the beast bleed. A slow death is all he deserves.
Let me explain the incredible skill systems now. You'll pick a class, and each class will then come with three unique skill trees. These in turn have abilities and passives that you can unlock and progress through use. Eventually, you're able to further morph these abilities into new unique effects, choosing how you want to morph an ability one way or another. And then you also get an ultimate ability from each of the skill trees. That's probably where most MMOs stop, right? Meanwhile, ESO just keeps going. Everything else uses skill lines too, coming with tons of new abilities and passives for entirely new playstyles. Every weapon in the game can be used by any class, and each weapon comes with its own skill line too, and they even have their own ultimates. Then there's the armor skill lines, coming with powerful passives that activate based on what armor type you're wearing. World skill lines for general gameplay, guild skill lines like fighters or mage guilds, which unlock intimidation or persuasion options in conversations, as well as all the abilities and passives as well. Any class could be a healer or a tank, or DPS, depending on what you focus or how you morph your abilities. It's an insane system that does actually allow a sorcerer to grab a two-hand sword and do some melee DPS. Naturally, there's always a meta right leaning towards what is strongest and most viable for each playstyle. A sorcerer could technically go for a tank role. Obviously, a Dragon Knight is always going to be a better tank compared, but it's a pretty flexible system, allowing you to completely change your playstyle after hundreds of hours of play on one class. Or min-max and pick the perfect race and weapon and skills for your specific role or whatever you want to do. The freedom is incredible. Every class can be any of the free roles, the tanking, the healer, or the DPS. It's just that, yeah, some classes are ideal for certain situations. On top of all of that, though, at level 15, you unlock the ability to swap between two weapon sets, i.e. as my character, I could be running around dual wielding with, say, two swords, and then suddenly mid-combat, swap to a bow for ranged combat, attacking enemies at a distance or kiting them out in PvP. It's a unique combat and class system that can bring thousands of hours of fun with varied builds and playstyles, even when you're end game and high level, and in fact, it's encouraged. Okay, so let's move on to what I think is the elephant in the room, the visuals. I've never seen a game that goes so back and forth on its visuals quite as much as ESO. Sometimes I'll see an armor set and be blown away by the detail and just how good it looks. Maybe I'll be in a cave and I'll just be blown away by the lighting. But then other times I'll be looking at the area I'm in and wonder if I'm back in 2005. It's obviously dated and when it's put under the spotlight and you really look at it, it's not the prettiest game. The lackluster ability animations are one thing, but the world itself does generally seem a bit dated. The regions are brilliantly designed. The characters look phenomenal. Everything fits with that Elder Scrolls setting. You've seen it before, but it's still cool. I see this game as an old style fantasy game and it certainly delivers on that. And I really appreciate it as an older style game. I love being in the Scrolls universe, but that does not stop me from acknowledging that visually this game is dated. Now, as mentioned earlier, the world is divided up into regions and those regions each have their own main storyline to follow. That storyline takes you across the whole region itself and they seem to have big important plots that affect things on a larger scale. In Morrowind, for example, the volcano was slowly becoming more and more agitated, and the god of the region was growing weaker as something was mysteriously sapping his power. And as we were uncovering this mystery, we would encounter many small towns around the place who have their own problems, linked or completely separate to the main plot. The towns have an icon to label them, but that icon will fill up once you've completed the main side stories there, with some extra lore to remind you of what happened there if you ever want to look back. I've been shocked by the quality of these side quests. In one town, I met a guy known as the Scarlet Judge, and and a plot in which the rich there were imprisoning innocent people to use them for personal labor. It was like a weird way around slavery. And as we progressed this multiple step story, which is a side quest again, we eventually became the new Scarlet Judge, keeping order in the land. And with that, we're rewarded a permanent outfit, a cosmetic, which gives us this really cool looking armor. A fun side story, great characters, a permanent and very impressive reward with a permanent cosmetic, all in one of the original regions. And because the game functions on a scaling system, that brings everything to your current level wherever you are. So you can play and explore in any region you want, 
any area at any time and it's completely fine. So you could pick a alt character and just go to a totally different location rather than repeating anything you've done before, enjoying a new story while playing a new class. Or move regions whenever you feel like it if, hey, you're not feeling the one you're in right now. Inside each region is a sort of checkmark system though. You have the main story, the side stories, and the delves, which are like mini dungeons you find all over the place that you solo. Then you've got the public dungeons that are much larger and filled with other players, or the match-made dungeons for the five-man group content. We can explore the land by teleporting to the various way shrines for fast traveling around, or after you hit level 10, you unlock your mount and you can roam around on a horse. In fact, the exploration is encouraged thanks to the Sky Shard system. These blue crystals are found all over the place in each region, inside dungeons or out in the world, hidden in different clever spots. And the reward for finding them is insane. When you find free Sky Shards, you're given one skill point, which you can spend on permanent upgrades to your character that you would normally only unlock by leveling up. This is a great way to encourage exploration and fully scour the land since these extra skill points are incredibly useful to improve your character in countless ways thanks to the insane multiple skill tree systems we were talking about. You could be a max level end game character still just roaming around regions and seeing things you've never seen before because you're looking for sky shards. Finally, I just want to mention a few extra little things. Firstly, the voice acting is fucking incredible. Every character that I've spoken with is fully voiced and any quest related character has extra dialogue options and interactions past what is necessary. The voice actors themselves do such a stellar job on top of that, I couldn't bring myself to skip anywhere near as much as I thought I would. Yes, I suppose you've come for a consultation? What is it? Unsightly warts? Poor eyesight? Flat feet, perhaps? You there. Keep your head down and come here. Hope you're not looking for passage off the island. The crew's on shore leave, see? The permanent kind. Bandits. I commend you for springing to this mayor's defense, but you should be cautious. I'm investigating some irregularities in Suran's justice system. This is a Scrolls game, right? So obviously we have the guilds and their stories and benefits. There's the mage, the fighters, and the thieves guilds. I assume the Brotherhood is somewhere in there. And there's also apparently vampires and werewolves too, of course. On top of that, we also have the classic bounty system you see in a Scrolls game with stealing and fencing off your stolen items pickpocketing, trespassing mechanics, and the bounty thing itself. When you're caught doing something a bit cheeky, you'll earn a bounty. And you can raise that more and more by doing more cheeky things like killing innocents, and things get expensive fast. If a guard catches you with a bounty, you can run away or fight, or just pay off your fine. But this makes for a fun mini game when you've got a bounty that you don't intend to pay off. So whenever you're in town, you're dodging the guards while you visit whoever you need to. It gives it a really cool RP feeling. Plus, Every town is designed with the thieves in mind. They have these hidden areas where you fence your items, right? And these hideouts are always away from the guards, hidden in secret places. I love it. The level system for combat is capped at 50 currently, but the levels themselves scale to something insane, like 1600, I believe. These are based on levels outside of combat, letting you work on many different progression systems and raising that number uh, after combat cap to benefit you in countless ways or work towards specific builds. But when you're 50, that's max combat. This is definitely something I need to reach Cat to experience and learn more about though. One thing I'd be amiss to not talk about in this video would be the crown store because it's a sort of in-game shop for monetization. It's basically a massive list of items that have utility, houses to buy, furniture to fill them up, cosmetics, boosts, all kinds of mounts, that stuff. But we also have the ESO Plus subscription which awards you with everything the game has ever added with expansions outside of the current and latest expansion, which I believe is Greymore at this time. Plus, and very importantly, you get a crafting bag for having a sub, which is very good for the insane amount of crafting items you find or gather from everything you do in the game. This bag has unlimited room, while the original game has to deal with running to the bank pretty often. The higher level you go, the worse this gets. I've been told that it becomes incredibly irritating at max level where you're doing any profession work without this crafting bag. So the sub sim is pretty important for an endgame player. So far I've been playing on the original version 
And that means after every venture, I need to take two minutes to go hit up the bank, sell some stuff, break down some items, so my inventory is fresh and ready for the next venture. It just means I can't go play in certain areas because I haven't bought that chapter. Currently, that means I still have an incredible amount of content to play through, but it will eventually run out as Endgame is obviously catered towards paying players. That's obviously not going to stop me from having a good time Endgame playing on the original game, but I would be getting a lot more with my sub or buying current or latest chapters with new raids and stories and such. I also want to mention the crown crates that are in the shop, which give random items. You buy this with shop currency, and it seems like some sort of garbage gambling loot crate system, so I definitely don't advise you interact with this. Apparently, you do get crown points each month as an ESO Plus sub, so you're free to buy some stuff on the saw with that, or waste it and gamble it on the crates if you want to. So, in conclusion... This game is big. After six years, the world has expanded and been improved upon many, many times. It still has a very unique atmosphere as an MMORPG, that scroll style game, but in an MMO setting. I love the combat, despite its clunky nature. The skill trees are absolutely incredible, and this is some of the best long-term progression I've ever seen. Visually though, it's certainly dated, and if you can't get past that, I think that'll be a problem. The world itself is rich in lore, and the stories are wonderful. The side content feels just as good as the main stuff half the time and exploration itself is super encouraged and that's great because it's awesome as someone stepping back into the scrolls universe I've loved it, but I completely recommend it to someone who's never seen it before. I can't believe how much I'm getting out of the game, its original version that I bought all that time ago, and it's right now on Steam, I think it's like 10 bucks. Even though there are some inconveniences here and there because I don't have ESO Plus, I can easily see myself playing to max and having a good time all on the original version. If my inventory space isn't detrimental to the experience, which hey, it might be from what I've heard. For a new player, buying one month of ESO Plus to try out, say, one of the many expansions or be more limitless in my inventory seems like high value for the money that it costs. But I do wonder what an end game player feels about the subscription thing and if they need it. Either way, should you try ESO in 2020? Absolutely yes. As a new player, I've been blown away by the game and I'm loving it. And I certainly would like to make a follow-up video about my thoughts about ESO Plus, trying some of the new expansions or the classes, and in the future, maybe what the end game is actually like to give you some real perspective on that. So let me know if you'd be interested in that. This video took some effort to make. MMOs are pretty big and there's a lot going on as it turns out, so I hope this was interesting or helpful. Let me know if you're going to give ESO a go. I'm playing on the EU servers and my Shadowblade is called you guessed it, Generation Hollow. So feel free to add me and say hi sometime. Maybe pop by a stream or join my Discord and we can play. For now though, I've been Hollow, you've been you, and I'll see you next time.